This is Chota Castle, an imposing house in the Chew Valley, south of Bristol. From what we can tell, the present building was developed from an earlier property called Castle Cottage in the 1860s. It was then called The Castle and later Castle Acre before getting its present name, which means Little Castle. Most of the surrounding fields used to belong to the property and even though a lot of land has been sold off over the years, the house still has impressive gardens with a sweeping view towards Chew Valley Lake. This film is about the man who moved his family here after the Second World War. The story of Edgar Bowden's life is a remarkable one taking us from his childhood in the bustling back streets of Eastville in Bristol to this quiet corner of North Somerset. And it involves a lot of paper bags. Right. Gate's gone from there. And we have a shed where the mulberry tree that's was. Where the, that's where the tennis court was. Yeah. No. No, the tennis court was over there. Oh, the portcullis is gone. Yes, that's No, the there's no passageway. Oh. Edgar's son David and daughter Patsy have come back to see how Chota Castle looks today. Gosh, this is different already. Yes. Well, there used to be a, a portcullis over there, or a part, an artificial one, but that's gone. And there were those sort of um, gates with black nail studs. In. How many years is it since you've been here, David? It must be 50 years since I last here. Not surprising there's a few changes, then. <laughs> <laughs> no, indeed. The um, thing around the front door is new, too. Yes, yes. But the I've doorbell pull is the same. Oh, the door's the same, too. No, no. That's the same. Yes. Because we used to keep the fire extinguisher there. Yes. Remember that? When we um, first had a telephone put in, the number was only four, if you remember, David. Oh, well, I remember it as 14. And then it went 141, and then 2414, and then I don't know. Yeah. Ah, so the t stairs have turned round. Well, where were they before? They were like they that. Went like they went like that. Oh, yes, of course they did. They, they went, around went like that. Like that yeah. All the black wood has gone from there. There was a big um, bookcase there. Mm. We had a large hall stand here um, with hundreds of coats and quite voluminous underneath. The grandfather clock stood here. Yeah. The father's desk was here. Yes. A kidney desk. I think in common with most young people, <laughs> when parents start talking about past times, they tend to shut off and think, oh, this is, they're rattling on again. So I'm sorry to say I didn't show the interest then that I now have. And uh, there were many questions I would love to have asked, but didn't. Fortunately for David, a book about his father's life was published in 1948. Most of my knowledge about my father's early life, in fact all my knowledge about my father's early life comes from the book. It was never really discussed at home. He never said to me that he had a hard time, but uh, it reflected in his attitude to the rest of the family. Edgar was born in 1896 at 108 Eastern Road, Bristol. The fourth of six children, he was quite a sickly child. He was weak, listless, and suffered from constant headaches, which meant he did poorly at school. Well, my father had a very hard upbringing, and um, his father was a bit of a, a hard man. His mother, perhaps less so, but not very much less so. And they had um, a fairly uh, poor background. 
His father was called Henry, and he was a printer, a printer lithographer, which was quite a skilled trade, I think, in those days. And he set up his own business, and the children were expected to work in that business. The area of Easton Road where the family lived has since been redeveloped. Henry's print works was around the corner in Bannerman Road. Henry prided himself in only doing high-class printing, but it was slow work and made little profit. Everything went well until his father had a very serious injury to his right hand, lost several fingers, which meant that uh, he couldn't set the type as easily as he could and work machinery as easily as he could. And so they were on hard times for a bit. The accident happened just before Edgar was born. Henry was left with only two fingers and no thumb on his right hand. It left him a bitter man. But he was determined to keep working and amazingly, he relearned to operate the press with ingenious gadgets he designed and made himself. To help make ends meet, Edgar's mother Florence first opened a butcher's and then a small grocer's and off license, which the family lived above. At the age of nine, Edgar had to be rushed into the BRI. A childhood ear infection had caused a hidden growth to slowly form. A large section of his skull was diseased and swollen and had to be carefully removed. The tricky operation was successful, but it left him stone deaf in his right ear. Soon the spirit and energy that had been masked began to shine through. But Edgar's father was still putting him down. His father despised him really said he would never be good for anything. All you'll be, all you'll be fit for is to sell something, uh, sell newspapers on the street corner, which of course riled father and he um, set out to prove otherwise and jolly well did. <laughs> Age 10, Edgar helped his mother by selling George's beer around the neighborhood. He proved to be a great salesman, and the brewery was so impressed they presented him with a specially made little cart. He said, and I think there's some truth in this, that his father, although he was um, very uh, full of energy and drive, but he wasn't a good businessman. And father suggested to him that some of the material that he was throwing away could in fact be used and make a profit. Edgar's big idea was that money could be made from the offcuts and the print works that his father was happy to throw in the bin. He got these things printed for little signs for shops like um, under new management or for sale or things like that. He did this going from shop to shop after school and at a time when he wasn't expected to work in the, in the factory, which occupied a lot of his time. In the early 1900s, there were lots of little independent shops all over Bristol. We think of Bristol as a city, but actually Bristol is a, a, a collection of different communities and there are high streets all over the place where there is the butcher and the baker and the greengrocer and so forth. And that's how people did their shopping in the days before uh, supermarkets. What you also got though in working class communities is there would be a corner shop. What we would nowadays call a convenience store, but a little shop selling everything from cigarettes and beer through to groceries. It was a time when sweets were sold, I'm not quite sure how they were sold, but not in paper bags. And father thought that this was quite a good idea to take paper bags to sweet shops so that they could sell their sweets in these bags. He saved the money, um, what he could. Most of it was expected to go back to the family, but he put a little aside and he eventually accrued for himself a secret cache of Stroppence Hapney. <laughs> and with this Stroppence Hapney, he would go and buy paper bags and he would sell those paper bags at a profit 
And with the profit, he bought more paper bags. And so he extended his business until he had quite a clientele. Shops sold many products loose then. And it seems sweets were usually wrapped in newspaper. Somehow, Edgar persuaded the shopkeepers to change their ways. He used to walk initially and then he bought a bike and he would go around to all these shops selling these paper bags. This uh, idea of selling paper bags to shops was an early sign of his, his business acumen and um, it was driven, I think, by the fact that he wanted to prove that he was better than just selling newspapers on the street corner. Back at Chota Castle, David and Patsy are continuing their trip down memory lane. This is um, nice in here. I think this part of the house was one of my favourite places because we had a lovely view, um, it was warm, you could look down the drive, see who was coming. It was uh, a very nice place in here. This has changed, hasn't it? There was a... Yeah, no, it was a, a there, hall stand here. There was a here. hall stand there. And here, there that was, was a, a big um, dresser thing. And do you remember at Christmas, we used to have uh, branches and you could put milk bottle tops squashed on top of a lemon squeezer so they looked like bells. And there was a large radiator here and the heat would make them tinkle. Oh, I can yes, always remember that. In 1910, the Bowden family were about to go up in the world to a brand new house at Broom Hill in Stapleton. Grandfather became adept at a lot of things and built his own house. The story I've heard, and I'm not sure, I don't think it's in the book, but Grandfather saw a building site where they were throwing away a lot of material that was surplus to use. And he said to the builder, I could build a house out of that. And the builder said, well, if you can, you can have it. And that's how he came by it. Not only did he build the house, but he made all the fittings for the house himself, even the hinges and the window catches. All the um, internal um, workings of the house was all constructed by grandfather with his injured hand. Again, his father was to test what 13-year-old Edgar was made of. And grandfather expected father to go and help him after school and at weekends. And they worked there until the early hours of the morning and then walked all the way back three miles to where they lived. So it must have been exhausting work. And uh, father was involved in the labouring of all this. Here are Edgar's parents, some years later, in the Broomhill house. You can just make out Henry's damaged hand. Around this time, young Edgar's life was about to take a completely new direction. Father somehow got into meetings that took him to a Methodist church. It was to do with a crowd of boys of his age who I believe were invited into what we would now call a youth centre who was run by a Methodist minister. And I think that he was very much influenced by this Methodist minister. And this had quite an influence on his life in the future. The same energy and enthusiasm he had for business, Edgar put into this new calling. At the age of 16, he'd moved out of the family home and, amazingly, he was a fully accredited Methodist lay preacher. As a lay preacher, he was still able to build up his business. He went on selling his paper bags until he'd got quite a bit of money saved up. Within a few years, Edgar was selling all sorts of bags to shops throughout Bristol. With the profits, he bought a grocer's shop and dairy in 1917, he met Winifred Fluke. They married, and their first son, Herbert, was born in 1918. 
When the First World War broke out, Edgar signed up, but he was invalided out after a few months due to the deafness in his right ear. Along with raising Herbert, Winifred ran a drapery shop, and both she and Edgar remained very active in the Methodist Church. The church worked among local communities, where there was a lot of poverty. Social conditions for the poorest in Bristol are really very bad. They're no better in 1920 than they had been in 1910. Basically, you have loads and loads of people, male breadwinners, spending their wages on beer, on becoming alcoholics. And of course, in most families, it is the, the, the male who is the sole breadwinner and the impact of this on their families is, is disastrous. So you have an awful lot of missions trying to get people to sign the pledge, that is to sort of sign an undertaking that you will not partake of alcohol. After many years based in different locations around Bristol, the Methodists built a massive central hall holding 2,000 people in Old Market to be the focus of their mission. It opened in 1924 and Edgar Bowden was a founder member. He remembered his days as a boy selling beer, often to poor families, and the misery it could cause. He enthusiastically led a silver band around the city centre pubs, encouraging people to come to mass rallies at the hall. Methodism puts this emphasis on sobriety, on hard work, on common sense, on not squandering your wages, gambling for example. And it's about telling people you've got to help yourselves and we can help each other. So it's a combination of self-help and collective action. So you know, Methodism in Bristol is a very powerful engine for social change and social reform. As well as being a lay preacher, Edgar was a steward and class leader at the Central Mission. He also started another new business. He opened a bookshop right by the main entrance, which today is a trendy cafe. This is what we call the breakfast room. Yes, this is and true. There was a wall across here. Oh, I know why it was called breakfast room. Because we had a system of bells. And in the kitchen, there was this box with indicators and the names of all the rooms. And you pulled the cord somewhere in the room and it tinkled in the kitchen. And that was the one from the breakfast yeah. room was here. We used to have a housekeeper and somebody, a daily, that would come in okay. as well. So um, we, we were quite well equipped with staff at one stage. Day. Yes, we did. Who was that? Someone from the village, must have been. Yes. Daddy quite liked having people about. We were three gardeners and, well, two gardeners, a handyman, and two people in the house. There was a door through here. And yes. And along this wall, and there wasn't a door there. No. And along this wall was a fairly modern so 1950s, I can call that modern, uh, fireplace, brick, which I didn't really like, it didn't really suit the house. In the early 30s, the Bowden family lived in a large house in Clevedon called Oriel Lodge. David was born there in 1932. Around 1938, they moved back into Redland in Bristol to be nearer Edgar's expanding businesses. The bookshop at Central Hall was a great success, as was Edgar's original paper bag business, which had to move to bigger premises. Then he did buy this warehouse in West Street in Bristol. The whole of the upper floor was storage for paper. By this time he was selling more than paper bags. He was selling wrapping paper and rolls of newspaper and all, anything to do with paper really. And my brother was working there too. In fact, for a few years before the war, he was doing all the deliveries for father. 
My brother, who was 14 years older than me, uh, was my hero. Herbert was also, in his spare time, a St John's ambulance driver. 1939, when the war broke out, he was called up and um, went into the army, into the RASC, and spent the whole of the war, either a dispatch rider or driver for the CO or driving tank transporters. But he used to come home and give me rides on his motorbike and um, brought home all sorts of trophies. I can remember the Blitz starting in Bristol. We used to go and sit under the stairs and wait until the all clear went. And uh, after a few months, Father decided it was time to get out of Bristol. Things were getting a bit too hot. I believe at that time he bought Chota Castle, but it was immediately requisitioned by the local authorities and was used throughout the war as a place for housing children who were orphaned in the Blitz. The nearby village of Chew Magna was relatively untouched by the war. But for one young boy at Rookstone House, the Bristol air raids left a lasting impression. One of my earliest memories from Rookstone House was the sirens going and my mother picking up my baby brother, who was born in 1943, uh, and taking him down to the shelter that my father had dug at the bottom of the garden. And I was left upstairs looking out of the window and the fire bombs, the incendiaries were dropping into the orchard below the house, between us and the river. And me being absolutely petrified, it was white, fire bombs, incendiaries were brilliant white magnesium. It was quite frightening. In fact, I think that was why I was such a nervous child, I think. And then my mother come up and picked me up and took me down there. Roy and his parents lived at Rookstone House with his grandparents. After the war, he and his brother would move to Chota Castle when Roy's father Clifford ended up working for Edgar Bowden. Father couldn't be called up because he'd lost his right eye in a motorcycle accident, but he was an air raid warden. So he worked all day at the timber yard where he was running the carpentry shop there, making lots of coffins for the Bristol for the Blitz. Over the winter of 1940-41, there are six very heavy air raids on the city, which uh, do a great deal of destruction. The official figure is 1,299 people were killed between 1940 and 1944. We moved to a small cottage in Langford. There were air raids on Bristol very frequently, and in fact one could read a newspaper in Langford by the light of the fires from Bristol, which was some miles away. And on one occasion, I remember they lit up um, a lot of decoy lights on the Mendips, which were just a few miles from the village. And this was quite a spectacle. There were a number of um, so-called starfish sites. Uh, now starfish was the code name for areas that were meant to uh, mimic, were meant to resemble a burning city if bombs had been dropped on them. What it is, is a sort of set of bonfires and lights that are to be um, illuminated when there is a warning of an enemy attack. They were reasonably successful in the sense that they attracted high explosive German bombs onto farmers' fields rather than built up parts of Bristol. A few hundred yards up the road from us there was a, a common and people were used to come out of the city at night. How they got petrol for their cars I'm not quite sure but they did and they parked along the side of the road on the common and father would go out and invite them in. So we had the whole house was absolutely full of people 
lying on the floor and propped up against the wall. As he went in and out of Bristol, Edgar saw there was something he could do for the many troops who were passing through the city. You have British servicemen, service women on their way to and from their units on leave. So this is a place where there are constantly large movements of people. And it isn't like nowadays where, you know, on every corner there's a convenience store you can get a sandwich or, or, or you can just, just, you know, pop into a restaurant. You know, there is food rationing in place. So feeding all these people is a major undertaking which requires a great deal of organisation and effort. In Old Market Street, just a few hundred yards from the mission, there was a building which was bombed early in the war and was vacated. Anyway, Father leased it and set up a forces canteen there. And it became absolutely crowded out. I don't remember how often it was open, but I know my mother used to go there cooking and serving meals. I'm not sure whether any money at all changed hands, but certainly it wasn't run for profit. No, it was, it was a, ser a service. David and Patsy are continuing their tour. So this is where we came through into the scullery. Yes, the scullery, and there was a swing door here. Do you remember, David? A swing door. And that goes down to the cellar, I should oh, imagine. Oh, yes. Um, and those weren't there. Um, there was a window here which looked out into the conservatory, which was there. That was a greenhouse, but it's not now. It's um, obviously done up as a party room, I would imagine. Yes. This was the kitchen, and this is where the old Arga was. Yeah. And that was where the bells were yes. that you were Box talking about. And there was a door there that went through into the freezer. larder type that was place. There was a walk-in freezer there. Yes, and the walk-in freezer was down the end and Father's ice cream machine. Where that radiator is, there were steps up there and doors into the conservatory. And as Patsy says, we came through here into the... Oh! It's expanded a little bit since we were here, Patsy. And then, because none of this was here. The war ended in 1945, and life started slowly to get back to normal. At last, the family could move into their dream house. We moved into Chota Castle and it was quite uh, amazing for me as a small child to see this place which really looked like a castle. Father was taken by this and had a portcullis made, I believe, by Clifford Gallup. We moved into the lodge on the, at the bottom of the drive for a short while, and while we were living there, converting the cow shed that's on right on the wall of the road next to the lodge, my father then started to work for, for Mr. Bowden. If the electrics went, he mended the electrics. He did a lot of the work on the tea rooms. I did a lot of work on the house. Yeah, general handyman on all fronts. Clifford was very good with them. Everything, he did the carpentry, he did the electricity, electricity wiring, he did the plumbing, and all of these things he taught me how to do. And I have been eternally grateful for learning all these skills from Clifford. If he asked us to go down and chop sticks, you know, while we were at Rookstone House, or we were to go and sweep up or do something, we all had little tasks to do. He, he would take out his glass eye and put it on the windowsill, and he said, I'm keeping an eye on you. It's quite macabre, isn't it? <laughs> I never saw that. Uh, but I do now remember that he had a glass eye, yeah. I didn't see a lot of Edgar Bowden. He, he was a busy man. We, we knew about Edgar's bookshop in Old Market. We knew that he owned some property in, around there, because I think my father used to go in and do some work on various places in, in town. But 
that was all rather vague to me. But um, yes, I knew that he was a businessman and I knew that he had a lot of connections. I think he became a local councillor as well. I can remember my father going around in one of Edgar's cars with a loudspeaker or something because there was an election coming up. Roy was a regular visitor to the main house. We seemed to be go up there quite often and certainly we'd be taking stuff up the driveway and going in and you didn't know when to go to the front door, you went through that archway. I can remember they had an Arga, or it might have been a Rayburn, which was constantly going and there's a lovely um, big kitchen and they used to put the milk on the back of the, of the Rayburn and it used to go into beautiful cream. David was now 14 and Edgar over 50 when he and Winifred welcomed a new addition to their family. They had adopted a little baby girl, Patsy. 1945 was not a very good time to have a baby out of wedlock. My birth mother, Kitty, who lived in Ireland, found herself somehow or other um, in the Bristol area. I've been given to believe that this could have been through the convent um, in Schumagna. Father was quite friendly with the nuns and I think he was put in touch with Kitty, who then came to live at the house, bringing me with her. And she stayed with us and looked after the cattle that we had. We had two milking cows, the pigs, uh, the wretched geese, and any of the other livestock. And she'd stayed with us until I was three. Patsy remained in close contact with Kitty, but she was now a Bowden. Well, I just remember them coming home one day with this um, small child and Kitty. She was only a few weeks old then, I think. And um, the plans were laid for adoption. And I forget how long that took, but certainly within a very short space of time. I feel that my parents adopted me because, yes, they may well have done. Daddy definitely wanted a girl. Because he already had two boys, and I'm sure he loved them in his way, but they came at a different time in his life. He had a lot going on in his life, but I'm not so sure that I turned out to be the dainty little girl that um, was hoped for. David and Patsy are now exploring the grounds. Originally, when we came here, was a tall witch elm tree, and it blew down in a gale, and it was remarkable in that the roots were all luminous. I presume some kind of um, fungus growth that uh, was on it. Anyway, when that was cleared away, left a big hole in the ground. So, father thought this was a good place for a pond, and there was a circular pond there. Yeah. And there was a privet hedge. A all... zigzag hedge all the way through here with oh, that's walkways. Gone. Walkways, that's been gone for quite a while, I think. Yes. And this was where we used to grow a lot of vegetables in that piece there. And there was an avenue of cooking apple trees. Yeah. And father was coming down here with a sit-on mower once. Yeah. And lost control and it finished up in the pond. Oh, it's a great amusement. <laughs> <laughs> Life at Chota Castle was dominated by Methodism, particularly on Sundays. I had quite a religious upbringing. We were expected, or I was expected, to go to church um, three times on a Sunday. Morning service, normally in Chumagna. Then in the afternoon there would be Sunday school and that was in Chu. And then in the evening we were all shipped into the car at half past five to go to the Central Hall in Old Market Street. And we had to go then because otherwise you wouldn't get a seat because it was absolutely full. It was an impressive building. It had a, 
an auditorium very much like a theatre. There were padded seats, fold-up seats all around, which all you get in churches. And he um, was on the platform in front, sitting on a chair with a row of other dignitaries, and the, uh, the preacher was in the middle, of course. There was an organ behind, and we all lustily sang hymns. Roy's father, Clifford, was organist at the little Methodist chapel in Chew Magna. We had to be regular churchgoers and I would go to the 11 o'clock service on the Sunday morning and uh, we used to sit there on the evening service and for me it was incredibly boring. And then of course, but I've forgotten, we had Sunday school in the middle of that, you know, so Sunday was really hard work and um, not to put too fine a point on it, I hated Sundays. Methodism was teetotal and you don't drink and uh, one or two of the uncles were quite heavy drinkers. And so you went to church on Sunday morning, we went to Sunday school in the afternoon. As soon as I come out of Sunday school we'd go over for tea and the un some of the uncles would be there and the bottles of George's would be opened. We learned to live in, in the dichotomy of two worlds. Traditionally, Methodists never used to have alcohol, um, were supposedly law-abided citizens, uh, and all right, good, boring people. I, I think that's best to describe it. Having said that, I lived in a Methodist household. They were not boring people. Edgar saw Chota Castle as more than just a family home, and he regularly opened the grounds for fundraising tea dances and garden parties. My father was always helping other people, particularly anything to do with the church. He would certainly run garden parties um, to raise money for the church. People were invited out just to spend the day in the countryside. I do remember the tea parties there and the, what would you call them, gala days things which were fundraising. He bought this cine camera and took quite a lot of films with it. He was always panning too fast, we always tried to stop him, but I think he felt the quicker you went, the less film you used up. I think there were a lot more people there than would have gone to the Methodist church, was for sure. And looking back at the old film of that, I can tell that there were a lot of people that were village people. I think Chew Stoke Church would have come and maybe the Central Hall would, people would have come out, you know. A whole mix of um, Methodists and village people. I hated it. The place just wasn't our own and people used to wander into the houses if they owned it and uh, I used to try and hide away in the kitchen or somewhere and all of a sudden there'd be people wandering through and asking me what this was and that one. The first thing was how young they looked. Oh, my father was instantly recognisable because of his glass eye. And seeing my mother serving tea and I just suddenly thought how graceful she was and this was something that you don't pick up as a child. And she moved about there, yes, gracefully, yes, with, with style, I thought, and that was very warming. <laughs> Over the years, Chota Castle was home to many galas, tea parties and church gatherings. Edgar's businesses continued to expand and now included a stationery and office equipment store run by Herbert. All this, along with his church activities, meant Edgar's time to spend with his family was limited. My father was very much wrapped up in the business and in Methodism, and the family became rather um, the last 
point of interest. I won't say that he was unkind and uh, certainly never violent, as his father had been, um, but not, uh, not, not a loving father who took great interest and showed his children things. Patsy's childhood experience was a much happier one. We had a fun relationship, um, my father and I, and he would take me for walks. And yes, we had fun, but I was expected to do my bit towards the business and so forth and fold paper. He was a great entrepreneur. He would have little things he wanted to do. At one stage, one of the garages were filled with hens because we were going to sell all these eggs. Uh, then we made lots of briquettes out of coal dust. That was done down in the cellar. He made loads of ice cream because we had a Guernsey and a Jersey cow in a proper ice cream maker. We also had Jew Valley Garden Supplies, which was on the Wells Road. And Mother worked in there at some stage and did a lot of floral um, tributes, um, wedding stuff. These were all greenhouses here. Yeah. Um, we had uh, vegetables in there when we had the Chew Valley Garden Supplies and then I kept horses in there. And this was done out with lawns all round and very smartly in a cross in the middle so you could get to each bed. And mm. then over behind that, a long um, Dutch greenhouse which was filled with tomatoes. That wall is new, isn't it, yes. to us? Yeah, yeah. So that would be the back of all the outhouses. Oh, the tennis court. That's where the ester reeds were. We grew a lot of chrysanthemums called ester reed. They were white. And my job was to pick these wretched things, put them into bundles of a dozen and dip them into buckets of dye different colours. <laughs> they were then taken into the sh shop in Bristol and sold. <laughs> White was not good enough. We had to dye these all different colours. Everybody was covered with this dye. So he would have these ideas and um, carry them through and they worked quite well. Mother just had to go with it. Not to put too fine a point on it, we were more or less considered to be slave labour. If there was anything that needed doing, then my brother or myself or my mother had to do it. And we all worked jolly hard. Herbert and David, they could remember the early days when father was striving to not only make the business successful, keep his church life going, but also his community life. Because not only was he on the parish council, and then the Royal District Council and Chairman of SED. Um, then he went to County Council. Then there was all the court work. Not only was he just an, a normal magistrate, he was a children's magistrate as well. He was on the visiting governors of uh, Hallfield Prison. Lots and lots of good works. And I think the boys saw how that took him away from my mother. We all know in the family that if mother was displeased, she would go to the dining room and the piano lid would go up and the music would get louder and louder and louder as she merrily played. And if she wanted him home quicker, she would play the piano. Not infrequently, he would come home and announce to my mother that he's invited uh, six people round for a meal that night. Was that all right? And she was expected to say yes. <laughs> Throughout their married life, Winifred had been at Edgar's side, supporting his many business schemes and church activities. She worked in different shops, taught in the Sunday school at Chew Magna, ran women's groups and entertained guests at Chota Castle. She carried out official engagements. 
and jointly with Edgar presented Chew Valley School with a sailing dinghy called Patsy in 1969, when he was head of the Board of Governors. She had a warm and close relationship with her sons and enjoyed seeing Patsy grow into a confident young woman. Winifred and Edgar had a long and successful partnership, but by the end of the 1960s, Edgar's health was failing. Edgar Bowden died in October 1972, aged 76, and his ashes were scattered in the gardens he loved at Chota Castle. It was the end of an era. When Daddy died, due to death duties and, and all the other things that crop up with people, we had to sell the businesses, uh, although the shopping office equipment was given to my elder brother. And the house itself was put up for sale. It was obvious that my mother wasn't going to stay there and all the furniture had to be sold and to sit in that large dining room and watch all your stuff be sold was absolutely horrendous. Because I loved the place so much, I had spent my entire life. The boys, not so. David and Herbert had been through several different houses um, when Dad was moving around and during the war, but I had always lived at Chu. I would know every nook and cranny and every plant, every tree. So when it finally went, it was shocking. I think it's, it's wonderful the way that successive house owners have developed this and certainly now it's in very good condition looking very nice indeed we can only wonder what young edgar striving to establish his paper bag business would have made of where he ended up he was determined that he was going to show his father that he wasn't a waste of space, to put it mildly, so that he was going to succeed financially. Then when he had some money to spend, he wanted to have the house at Chew, because it was, I'm sure he wouldn't be upset if I said this, a status symbol. So it showed he was getting on in the world. He wanted to be in the lead with local Methodism. He wanted to be on the local council. He, would, he was a JP. Uh, he was a Freemason. All these things which he felt would improve his, his image in the public eye. And when you think that his father told him that he would be good for nothing but certain newspapers on the corner, you can quite understand. Considering his early life, he pulled himself up, he fought his way through, and one of his favourite hymns was always, fight the good fight with all your might, and he did that. So I would like to hope that people would always remember him, and there's not many of us left now, as a man who always had the best of intentions for everybody and lived his life to the full. Um, and I hope he'll be remembered for that. With falling attendance and rising costs, Chew Magna's Methodist Chapel closed in 1968, and the Bristol Central Hall in the 1980s. Both have been redeveloped into private accommodation. Winifred moved to live with her long-term companion, Olive, in Knoll and died in 1993. In her last years, she attended Chew Magna Baptist Chapel and both she and Edgar 
are remembered by this tablet near the chapel entrance. <laughs>